it would. Well, I, I think know, it, Mothman is kind of interesting in like you're talking about those clusters of sightings, right? That's that's kind of like the main argument is if they were there, you know, although these areas are very vast, I mean, you're talking about, you know, but not necessarily uh, all of them. Yeah, not. No, they're sighted in areas that are not very vast. You're right. But, you know, you'd think that a body would show up. So it, it, it's it's one of those things that like, you know, if you're looking at it scientifically, it's very hard to, you know to prove um i have you know I've, I've i used to watch various shows on on bigfoot like in sasquatch and the sasquatch phenomenon and you know they have audio recordings of what these they you know these unknown sounds in the forest of you know animal of some sort they have um i think hair samples from a few course footprints that they've you know made plaster from but you know i don't really i don't really know a whole lot on the, you know the scientific aspect of it uh what interests me more is, is is sort of this you know paranormal aspect of it and why several of these things appear where other activities is going on uh namely ufo activity as i said before one thing i don't know if you followed it that much but uh cattle mutilation have you have you looked at this phenomenon uh sometimes when it comes up i i, I don't i i look at the stories kind of in a bit by bit function i'll look at something as an expression of a particular phenomena so i don't necessarily fall in mass phenomena i also don't necessarily think that you can always correlate cattle mutilation to a predator, for example. I I don't think so either. You know, you can correlate it to to natural causes, for sure. Um, also, good evening, Karasu. Um, yeah. Uh, various things like that, but you know, some of these. I was watching just recently a, a documentary, um, like a news documentary of where you know it's happening, and they showed you know several. Um, cattle carcasses they have their blood drained various puncture wounds genitalia uh removed um reproductive organs removed and the most curious thing is the ribs were broken as if you know like i mean just snapped as if they fell from a great height so you know it's it's something you know it's a phenomenon that 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 has occurred you know, in quite large numbers, and there is a pattern that people see like that. So how do you explain something like that? You know, how does, I don't know of any predator that exists that, you know, can drop a cat cow. Blood. What can pick yeah. up and drop a cow? Yeah, it can pick up and drop a cow that that high, you know, enough to, to break its ribs, which are strong, you know, from a various from a very high height. And um, to remove, like, what seems to be, like, surgically their, you know, uterus, things like this. And, you know, that's that's weird. How do you explain that? I hope you're and actually... The farmers who have these cows, you know, are just as horrified, just as flabbergasted about it. So... Well, if you think yeah, about it... Those cows are an incredible investment of time, and an, like a ranch is a generational kind of project. Oh, it is. It so is, so losing a cow is a very traumatic experience to begin with. Of course, or a sheep, or, a sheep or any yeah, you know, any animal. livestock, yes, but it's it's a very financially fraught experience to begin with. So there's not much incentive to fake something like that. Um, oh, there's no there's yeah there's not a ton of his incentive. And why would it, it it appear, you know, not in just one place, but, you know, in, in other locations and to, to remove with surgical precision, you know, various organs like that, you know, that's not 
something uh, your average rancher maybe if he was like a vet you know there are some that are probably veterinarians or have some sort of background in that you know i couldn't rule that out but you know that's not your average rancher's education <coughs> yeah so, you know that's pretty weird it's a lot of effort to do something like that and it, there's no financial incentive for it as you said um about cryptids going back to you know that phenomenon i think one that has always interested me has been the mothman and particularly particularly the events in i think it was it's point pleasant west virginia yes um you know that followed the sightings that preceded you know the the, the bridge collapse the sightings of them preceded like a bridge collapse and various other things and um covered extensively you know. in hell year. uh did you remember back in 2017 when there were stories of sightings of mothman in chicago yeah 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 of, of around the lakefront yeah i guess or near o'hare i forget yeah i didn't really do a whole lot of um looking into that surprisingly i think i was i was too busy doing you know master's research but like um, oh i was definitely sitting on my roof looking looking around when i was still living there uh never saw never saw a mothman disappointed i, I am too <laughs> um that would be one that i would that i would love to see actually i don't think i'd want to see any of these to be fair it, it, it would well i, I think Mothman is kind of interesting in like you're talking about those clusters of sightings, right? So you get the stories uh no problem, Pippa. You get the stories that are tangential to Mothman, like Indrid Cold. And you get and the yeah. UFO sightings associated with him at the same time. And you get uh Was Indrid Cold that person or whatever entity that was calling people like sort of like a men in black kind of um no uh not that i can tell there's definitely is a men in black story connected with mothman uh let me bring up the image and put it on screen i don't want taz injured cold is not taz injured cold is creepy looking do, 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 do. you share this screen You know, I, I remember watching the Mothman prophecies and him being like that, that being mentioned, but I, it's been such a long time since I watched that film. Yeah, Indrid Cold is called the Smiling Man, and he appeared to, uh, I think his name is Robert Derenberger. Mm -hmm. Is this a journalist cover? No, it was a the... salesman. Uh Woodrow Derenberger, that's the we one. All, we all know that Salzman's statements of Salzman are very credible. Clearly, he has a lifetime yeah, warranty. Yeah. There was a Hungarian horror movie about Mothman. I wouldn't be terribly surprised. But he, he so so Woodrow Derenberger described a situation where he's driving along between Point Pleasant and another town one night, and a big spacecraft lands out in front of him, and this tall, smiling man gets out. Um, and comes up to his car and talks to him and asks him about a certain number of things and then flies away. Uh, and then over the years, Darren Berger continued to concoct stories and his daughter continued to, to put out stories about their interactions with injured cold and they built a kind of myth mythology around it. Um, it's very hard to nail down that particular set of stories, but at the same time, two kids near Point Pleasant walking home from the movies one night reported being stalked by a similar looking man. That's just, I mean, just the, the I don't know why, but you know, the depictions of ETs that are like, you know, semi-human with something off about them those encounters scare me so much more than like for example your typical grays or like things like that although 
the grays are a very scary phenomenon too. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's something, you know, I have very weird, um, fears and I think that they're one of them. Um, yeah. I'm going to pull that off real quick. Uh, yeah. The, the, the thing is, um, and that's the point I think of this particular image, like the way this is, the way this is, uh, this gets into like to tie it back into something. Remember in Rogue One when they had Tarkin, the CGI yeah. Tarkin on, and everyone thought it looked really off. Yeah, that concept. There's a phenomenon like that in in, in robotics or like Andrew, you know, cybernetics. I forget the the term for it, but it's when you build something that is not human but too human that it creates like this uncomfortable feeling among it's called the uncanny valley yeah the uncanny valley so yeah. uh, like that that we have this ability to recognize when something isn't quite right is a really interesting phenomenon to me you're you're what's the matter oh you you're hello hello uh i think my can you hear me I, yeah, I can hear you. We're good. Okay. I think we're good. But this, yeah, this your, your connection was yeah coming out. Let me put this closer. Yeah, there we go. The uncanny valley okay. is kind of a like a really weird idea. Like we can sort of tell when something's not quite right, and like you could tell that that tarking wasn't Peter Cushing type thing, and like where this kind of comes from this this just not quite right idea has made a lot of people speculate. I think there's a logical explanation for it, but it's really That's interesting that it exists. Yes. Like, consider we are not the first it set. Is, it is interesting. We're not the first set of humanoid species, like Neanderthals are humanoid, but distinct. It could be very easy to imagine a situation yeah. where that instinct evolves so that we can recognize the difference between a homo sapien and another type of hominid. That, that, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder, you know, if, you know, for example, like, uh, one of us were to go back in time, we would have that upon seeing, you know, another hominid species like Neanderthal. Um, I vote you go back in time. The, the thing is, the only, the only hole in that theory is that among Europeans, in the European genome, there is Neanderthal, like they've, you know, done genetic studies of it. There is actually trace amounts of that of Neanderthal DNA. So they did humans, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens and uh, Homo sapiens Neanderthal. I, I think that's the name. I don't want to any biologists or, you know, people uh, on our channel think Homo, homo sapiens Neanderthalis or something like this. Um, there was um you know interbreeding between these two species and they were genetically viable too i mean close enough probably they, you know, but sure. that doesn't necessarily pre yeah. preclude the concept of the uncanny valley like I, and i think that's yeah. part of it part of it like anything we see as paranormal we oftentimes front load is scary so we see yeah. ghosts as something to be afraid of or um we make the we perceive them as like demonic infestations or what have you um and another thing i think is really culturally interesting about all of these things is how often they tie back into religion like our understanding of the paranormal is very oftentimes based in our understanding of christian to, you know yeah in in the west it's of course linked to judeo-christianity um in the east it's it you know towards Buddhism or Confucianism or, you know, the traditional ancestor worshiping religions in, you know, whatever country. But yeah, that's problematic in terms of looking at it, the phenomenon itself, because, you know, Oops, sorry. if you approach, if you approach, you know, like, for example, ghosts um, from a Judeo-Christian perspective, it's sort of antithetical isn't it 
It is. And like, that's one of the reasons I really enjoy, like, uh, the two people, the, the Greg and Dana Newkirk is a family around Hellier that, that did the investigation and they sort of built this thing around it. They do, uh, a traveling museum of the paranormal and the occult. And uh, it's actually one of the few patrons I pay monthly for. Um, but uh, they, they take this perspective. They kind of take this perspective and try to remove it from the contemporary religion of the time. So they don't necessarily subscribe to the fact that something that scares them is demonic or et cetera, et cetera. They try to look at things as they are. And they, they do their own podcast called... Uh, uh, the title is eluding me, but it's on their channel. Haunted Objects Podcast. That's it. I'm trying to try and invite some of these people. I don't know if, if we're, we're probably way too small to start doing that, but um, it would be very interesting to talk to some I would... of these people. I think that, that approach towards researching the paranormal is a lot more holistic. I think it, it does work. And plus the podcast, by the way, is hilarious. Um, definitely worth watching. Um, but they've done a couple neat things. Like they went and hunted Bigfoot with Gold Bloom, Jeff Gold Bloom. Um, and they ran a couple other neat shows. Yes, he did a Disney, yeah. or he did a National yeah. Geographic show, which was on Disney Plus. Um, which I was doing when I wasn't watching Star Wars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and they they have this kind of holistic thing where they take it and they they sort of try to explain it. And they did an episode a couple weeks back uh, about a Dybbuk box. I don't know if you ever heard that story. Yes, the Dybbuk box. I know, I know a lot about the Dybbukim, you know, in terms of uh, Jewish tradition. And there's no such thing as a Dybbuk uh, box in Jewish Jewish tradition. Anyway, uh, they did an episode about that. You know that are not part of Jewish Judeo Christianity. A lot of you know sort of folksy things that made it into you know Ashkenazi Jewish culture that um, you know are not. They would be looked upon it in in many ways as heresy or you know antithetical um, antithetical in you know traditional Judaism, but they practice these things. For example, um, it was common for Jews in Eastern Europe to have amulets, for example, to ward off against various curses and things like this. Um, same thing with Christians also in yes. Eastern Europe. Uh, that's the interesting thing actually about Eastern Europe as compared to Western Europe. You have a lot more of, um, you know, less of this witch panic and, you know, occult panic. It, it exists, but, you know, it doesn't reach the, I don't know if it's, it's maybe because in Western Europe you have, you know, very large church structures, which are heavily tied to government. Whereas in, you know, Eastern Europe, it's a lot more loose. You know, that's just kind of the nature of the of the Orthodox Church in general. And um, what's interesting, too, is, um, you know, there are witch trials in Eastern Europe, but the vast majority of people who are accused of witchcraft are men. So they don't have this massive, you know, killing of, of women in, yeah. uh, in Eastern Europe. It, very interesting, I think, is... Uh... There's a different approach that happens with like in Eastern Europe, especially because they have this fusion of pagan and Christianity that's much more upfront than the one we're used to. Because you and I because Christianity comes there a lot later. Yes. Because you and I are very used to you, you were non denominational or you are non denominational if I recall correctly, right? Yeah. And and I was raised Catholic left by mm -hmm. See ya. Anyway, there's this that are very much hiding the pagan undertones in this Western Christian tradition. And that just doesn't happen. Like, for example, my grandmother's family's from Lithuania. Um, and it's much more pronounced in her side of the family. Oh, it's in the Baltic countries, especially yes. Lithuania and Latvia. It's extremely pronounced because these are the last countries that are, um, you know, brought into Christendom in Europe. And, you know, there's still songs 
traditional folk songs in Lithuanian that mention the sky god, you know, the yeah. version of the Indo-European sky god. I think Perkunas is the name of it. So, yeah, the same you can find this in Slavic cultures, too, in a lot of them. Um, and even, you know, the practice of icon, you know, iconostasis or whatever, this is has pagan roots. Yes, um, I... Uh... Various... Um, were given the persona of various Slavic uh, pagan gods. So, like, I think the... I don't know if it's St. George or St. John, I forget, who is... Um, you know, associated with Perun, the lightning god of the Slavs. There are far too many um, saints. That's a whole another topic we can nerd out about. You know, I, you know, you know, I was about to say, one day we should sit and talk about Indo-European faith and how it's spread and how you see so many different aspects of it all across the world. It's really one of the neatest things, I think, is that... One thing, you know, you know to, to, to go on with that topic, a lot of people who, you know, they study um, the Hellenic world and Roman world together. And it makes sense because they're so geographically sort of they have ties. But, you know, Jupiter is still, you know, from what I understand, it's the same difference as, for, for, for example, Pekunas and Perun or, you know, Thor or something like this. They, they're separate name they're not the same exact same god they might share certain traditions and stories because um you know the geographic proximity but as i understand it the romans have their own pantheon which you know it's closely tied to the greek pantheon but it's still a separate pantheon yeah that's like one of the things that i have noticed like you talk about commonalities in these clusters of activity like People recognize lights and weird lights, and I'll be, I, I've spent a considerable amount of time in the woods at, in the dark, and I will fully cop to the fact that if you're not grounded while you're out there, it's kind of creepy. Um, it's easy to scare yourself. It, 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 it's innately creepy for a human, for a person, because, I mean, that's, that's our biology. That's, you know, the dark is, is the time where you're most vulnerable. Where yeah, you cannot see your senses are 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 you know nullified, and um, it's the most dangerous time to be you know for predation. I mean, that's that's where the roots of that of that fear of the dark come from. That's a very natural uh, a fear. Absolutely, and the the thing that used to get me, like in, in ROTC, we used to do night land navigation, right? So we go out and look for yeah. trees in the forest at night, which, by the way, is ridiculous. Uh, anyway, uh, you're looking for specific tree in the forest. It's a whole lot of fun. At any rate, the, all you've got with you, as far as light goes, is a military issue flashlight, which is a red light, and it's not yeah. very strong, and it's very easy to scare yourself when you're out there alone. Like you have to, you have to keep your head about you. So I get why people are inherently afraid of the dark and they have this cluster sightings. Cause I swear to God, I've been out there and I've heard weird sounds that I know are just perfectly normal things in the daylight that are sound much more ominous at night. Yeah. And it's because of that just natural fear that we have as human beings. Um, yeah. And also, you know, unless you're someone who's very, you know, uh, who has a lot of experience living in the outdoors and, you know, hearing those sounds, you know, for someone like yourself or, you know, some other cadets who are there, you know, just, you know, they have these training you know, missions, how, how often, not very often, you're not going to know what some of those sounds are. Well, in, in, in fairness to me, I have spent a considerable amount of time in my childhood in the woods, so. Uh, yeah. Because we got that place in Wisconsin. Um, and that's damn near Canada, where it's at, so. Yeah, in the north woods, right? <laughs> yes, way north. Uh, but that, that forest is so familiar to me at this point. And because it's on a peninsula, it's so self-contained yeah. that I tend not to worry. Um, is that um, near, like, uh, Lake Superior? It's pretty hard to not be near Lake Superior at that point. Not particularly close, really. It's about an hour and a half away. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of close. 
Uh, but so, I have yeah, a friend who, um, I, I can relate uh, an experience of a, of one of my best friends. He also, you know, throughout his childhood, um, he used to spend time in the uh, north woods of Wisconsin. And his father is actually um, a well known uh, snowmobile racer. One of the best, actually, and I think maybe the best um, for what he does in North America. And he recounted to me a story of him, his father, and his cousin. There were, you know, I think in the UP, maybe even, uh, maybe a little south of there. So, like, you know, probably Wisconsin. And they saw an illuminated humanoid figure walking in the distance. And my friend said, you know, it was his father said, I don't know what that thing is, boys, but I don't want to find out. And they essentially just booked it. Yeah. Uh, From it. But in areas, this is another thing I want to bring up with cryptids is they occur. You know, the, the phenomenon tends to occur in very remote places, UFO sightings too, you know, much, much, much more so than, you know, in built up areas. Although with UFO sightings, you know, you have very famous cases like the Phoenix lights and, you know, of, of them being sighted over cities, but like, um, you know, like why do, does this phenomena occur in remote forests that, you know, have very little human habitation. That's that's something that's that's odd to me. Um, it's not odd, you know, looking if you're looking upon cryptozoology as a you know just a, a singular phenomenon. So, of course, you're gonna there if you're looking upon them as you know some sort of unknown um, biological creature, tangible creature. It makes sense that you know okay the that they would exist in a remote area. To me, it, 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 it's a little odd that a, you know, a hominid would exist in, you know, North America, especially, you know, in regards to like forage base, because, you know, our closest ancestors, chimps and gorillas, um, gorillas, I think, are almost entirely vegetarian, almost, almost entirely in chimps. Um, but they eat insects, don't they? Gorillas do eat insects. Chim- chimpanzees do eat meat. They actually work. yes, I know chimpanzees do. Chimpanzees are kind of disturbingly weird, just in general. Chimpanzees are are that one animal. You know, I always, I always tend to love animals more than I like people, and chimpanzees might be a, an exception to that rule. They just there's so much like us, and even worse in some aspects. I think. Yeah, but I I don't necessarily. Like, much of North America in general, both the United States and Canada especially, I'm not entirely certain about the population density in Mexico. I should actually look at that one day. But like huge swaths of this country are just utterly unoccupied. There's so much empty space with which there is a ton of empty space. And, and one of the one of the hard and fast rules I've kind of learned in life, if you're not actively watching something, you don't know what's going on there. It's just you, you can't really speculate or whatnot. Like, so you'll get cases like these ranches. Like, there's a couple stories out here in Colorado uh, that are really um, interesting and fortunately at least 30 miles away. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Hang on. Okay, we're back. I thought we were about to lose the stream. Okay. There, there's a couple stories in Colorado that are just like, like a lot of those cattle mutilation stories. I've been hearing some of those recently too here in this state. In various counties, um, there are a lot of Native American legends out here too. Like, did you watch um, on Netflix? I don't know if you have Netflix or not. It's not on my streaming watch, budget um, currently. The reboot of Unsolved Mysteries that just you know they just yeah. So I mean, it's not a shadow of how it was when Robert Stack posted it. You know, it's kind of singular episodes, much, much more in line with like modern, you know, crime uh, documentaries. But um, they also do, you know, they stick to their old formula of doing, you know, paranormal and, you know, 
unexplained phenomena. And uh, one episode that they did recently was, um, you know, on the uh, uh, sightings in the uh, Cherokee or Na no Navajo Nation. And, of... You know, they interviewed a ton of um, the Navajo park rangers, and you know, they explain some of the things that they've seen. You know, which you know range from these hominid creatures to UFOs. And the interesting thing in Navajo legend is they say that they came through the sky in their legend, like a portal is what kind of like, I mean, they don't have the word of, of, of curse, you know, to describe, I think, portal, like, like, you know, they don't have a word for that, but that is how they describe their origin story. I mean, it's not something that's uncommon among you know, various people, but it's interesting. And the way that they look at this phenomenon <laughs> It's largely, you know, through these, uh, you know, their own religious background and their own yeah. background. And it's very interesting. I really recommend you watch that episode if you have the opportunity. Uh, I, because, well, um, we'll see. I don't know who a net Netflix password I have to steal anymore. Native American, I'm reading chat. Native American legends getting popular in creepypastas now by the phenomenon of urban legends and creepypastas are important here too. Yes, I absolutely agree, Karasu. Um, we recontextualize and reconstruct myths and stories through these modern retellings, even if they're kind of, you know, Reddit shit posts. They still have some, I think, cultural value um, because they're coming from a place like, like even necessary stories that are on the face, not believable, that come out of creepypastas. Like, I think the one coming to mind immediately is the Russian sleep experiment. Seems plausible. The Russian sleep experiment is so, I mean, it's not, there's no truth to it. No, there's absolutely no truth um, to it, but very, it feels real yeah. at times. Like, there is a feeling does, yeah. to it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there was um, another... Another creepypasta that I read a long time ago, it was, um, this is where bad kids go, and it's, the setting of it is in Lebanon during the Civil War there, and essentially they were talking about a show, like a television show that was being aired at the time where, you know, whatever, the car, it was a cartoon that had some moral message, and at the end of the show there were credits, and uh, a shot of a room that had a chair and various, like, you know, torture, um, torturous devices. And it said in Arabic, this is where bad kids go. And sometimes they'd hear screams and things like this coming from that room. And, uh, yeah, those are, you know, the people who come up with some of those stories are brilliant, you know. Just as brilliant as a lot of the great horror writers that, ex that are you know, around now, like, Stephen King or Dean Koontz or some of these other people, but yeah, I remember the Russian sleep experiment, and that's something I, I, I enjoyed that story a lot. Um, you know, to get into to the history of, of something like that, there weren't as many, um, there were doctors in gulags that did, you know, various research on, you know, especially on how much, like, prisoners could work, you know, in regards to like their you know the nutrition they were being given but there wasn't like unlike you know in the in the um in the case of the the nazis or the japanese um there wasn't any sort of like you know human experimentation going on at, at that you know widespread of a level um so you know the, the russian sleep experiment of course is completely false but it's a very interesting tale it's compelling i think in a very unique way um it is yeah what one of the other very compelling stories to me i think uh everyone should watch hell here while you're here also while we have viewers in chat i have pinned at the top a GoFundMe for a family that is working to step not be homeless if you are able please consider donating uh, it would be help out a great deal. Um, where was I? I? I had a thought and I lost it. Damn it. Um, that was important though. So it was important. Uh, yeah. One of the stories that I, I, I everyone go watch Hellier. The stories that came out of that is this concept of these 
tiny creatures that appear all up and down the Appalachian range, um, coming out of caves and whatnot. Like, it's a really compelling story, or much more pertinent to us, tiny creatures that live in cornfields. I don't know if you've ever heard those stories. No. No, I never have. What are they? Just, actually, I need to bring that up to do the full story justice. That was a story that was not terribly common in Illinois. I mean, you consider how close you and I live to cornfields for most of our lives. Of course, yeah. Where we grew up. Yep. <laughs> Creatures in cornfields. I'm somehow, you know, brought back to like the. I don't know if you've seen the movie Children of the Corn, like this, you know, sort of uh, god like demon that, you know, manifests itself in the cornfields and somehow in some Nebraska town town they make a pseudo Christian religion out of this corn god and kill all it I don't know why they do it. They kill all the adults. And yeah, that's pretty much the idea behind the customer service at Chick fil A. Um <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I went there. Trick fil A creeps me out. Like they're, they're like my pleasure. Like just just chill out a little bit there, Gertrude. I've uh, never, you know, I I have never had the de- I don't know why. Um I've never been there and I've never had the desire to eat there. Not even, you know, for any political reasons. But that's well it's the same. I don't go now because of the money they are putting into things L anti LGBTQ things, but I never liked it the couple times I went before that. Like, it wasn't that much of a sacrifice to me to eat the bigot chicken. Um, when it first came in, that same friend that was, yeah, when it when it first came in, that same friend that I had mentioned who had, um, you know, I recounted his story about that um, unknown, you, you know, creature or phenomena thing that he witnessed. Um, he, um, he works, uh, does paving. He's done it for most of his life now. This was when Chick-fil-A was new in the area. And I remember uh, um, somebody was coming out to, you know, his company and they were giving them free stuff for Chick-fil-A. And I remember we were at uh, the Borders in, um, in uh, Orland, or in, you know, the... Uh, uh, you know, near where we live. And um, my my friend was, you know, wanting, he was so adamant that we go and try it. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to go eat that. And we ended up not doing that. And then when he did, he ended up getting sick, like really bad. So. Yeah. No, Carol, see, that's exactly right. Like, I think there is a lot of ways that horror stories and science fiction stories intersect in how they try to explore humanity. Um, there's, there's a lot of themes that run very similar to, uh, throughout both. And like there's kind of this what both science fiction and horror kind of ask a similar question of what we become in the absence of what we know. Um, anyway, corn. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got to explain this to me because this is the first. And as we stated, I, you know, we lived, you know, around corn our whole lives. So I'm, I'm wanting to know what, um, what is this phenomenon? I used to work at a cheese factory on the edge of the cornfield in southwestern Minnesota. There were a series of days in the summer of 04 or 05 where it was so hot that the milk being delivered to us on the trucks would evaporate before we got it. It made work easy. The dearth of milk denied us any actual labor, but management wouldn't let us not come to work, so we'd show up and mess around all shift. Um, I was working nights at the time. It was 2 or 3 a.m., and I was out loading dock watching bats fly around the floodlights because I liked hanging out in the cool night air. The corn was about as high as my shoulder, so about five foot 10 inches 
As I was watching the bats, I looked down at the edge of the cornfield. Something was moving there. It was the size of a small child and very, very skinny. Pale, with something that looked like a head of straight black hair. It moved in a sort of jerky gait, like someone dancing the robot badly. It moved in chunks, legs and hips and torsos, shoulders, neck, and finally head. It was looking back into the cornfield, or at least it felt like it. I felt prickly all over. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a heron or something at first, but it looked too much like a person. It didn't move like a person, though. Gradually, step by step, it moved toward me. Letting my curiosity better my fear, I moved towards the edge of the dock, which was raised a few feet off the ground when I was paralyzed. I could have run, but I was stuck somewhere between terrified and intrigued. It moved. Its face, such as it was, still pointed at me. It ratcheted its body and disconcerting, jerky movement towards the cornfield that went into it. I tried to watch the field moved as it passed, but the corn remained perfectly still. I noticed that all the crickets were silent. After a few minutes, nothing happened. I stood out there for an hour, but it never came back again. You know what that sounds kind of similar to? What? You heard the stories of people disappearing in the forest and everything goes silent, called the silence? No. I wanted to, to mention that, you know, there's kind of, regarding cornfields, you know, the, the what makes that terrifying is when you drive by, you know, a cornfield, especially during, you know, peak harvest season, so like maybe anywhere from July, August, you know, the stalks are very large and it's just this dense row of plants so you don't really you know what appeals with that story i think what why, why you know you could why it's effective is you really don't know what's in that you know in the field you can't see everything in it and i think that that's you know one of the reasons why it's it's so creepy it's so scary because you know i've you know walked through i don't know if you have probably but like walked into a cornfield yes and you really can't see anything in front of you well it's it's very it's very interesting too like you can't scan into them with things like thermal sensors in a cornfield really yes wow so like Search and rescue teams have to go into cornfields and search them if there is a lost person because they can't send the planes up because the planes use thermal sensors to detect people. So mm -hmm. the cornfield but isn't. With a forest, forest, that's not a problem. Yes, but that's not as thick and it's not as hot. Like it's hot yeah. inside a cornfield, it gets very hot. Um, because you're basically, it's, it's like a little greenhouse type thing when you're inside of it at the right time of year of um so that concept of people of something living in there or coming out uh, uh probably would have made me more cautious as a kid <laughs> um and then going in them yes i don't know i um i mean i've never i can't say that i've like ever traversed a cornfield but i remember just you know playing as a kid with my friends we you know be on the edge of some woods and we go in but you know we never we never uh went you know too far in just because it's uncomfortable like you said it's hot it's itchy you know you have all these plants spiders things like this and it's it's not a really fun place to hang out you know a forest is 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 a place you know a forest preserve great place for kids to hang out you know or like a little patch of of woods that's perfectly okay but a cornfield you know you're really just too dense there's something strange in the cornfields in hungary that never got that stuff as in the u.s we call it the tengri let me look that up hungry you know that you could vaguely familiar I'm also could... really glad that we have a Hungarian viewer. I'm guessing this was the same guy who was talking about uh, Christian Ungvari earlier. 
Yeah, my my grandparents had a farm. My mother on my mother's side had a farm, and they planted for quite a while. That looks like a sea slug. Tenger. Okay, Tenger is a sea. That makes sense. It's also apparently a cryptocurrency. Figures. Oh, that kind of looks like a sea monster. That makes sense then. Have you ever then. heard of the, um, the Slavic water demons, the Rusalka? Yes. Rusalka? Yeah. Yeah, Rusalka. Yeah, because I played Call of Duty Black Ops when I was a kid and trying to figure out what the name of that damn ship was. The Rusalka? Yes. Um, because <clears throat> that was the name of the transmitter ship in Call of Duty Black Ops. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the name of a fairly decent episode of the uh, show Madam Secretary, too. So, I don't, you actually should probably watch that show as an aside. Um, what is that show about? It's about a, a woman who becomes Secretary of State. In uh, it's a kind of a, a sequel, a modern sequel to The West Wing in a certain sense, but it is it's definitely post two thousands, so it has that kind of idea of a political show that has to have intrigue and a conspiracy to it. So in the second season, they have a arc where Russia attacks Ukraine. Um, what year did this take place? This particular, hang on, Madam Secretary, season two. I'm, not, I'm just, yeah, I'm wondering when did it was the, the show. I think it was. Okay, so I, you know, was using events that had just happened. Yeah, it was May, it was 2014, 2014 you know, 2015. What's interesting is, what's interesting, you know, not to diverge, but even though you know i mentioned before none of us will get more on this when we talk about it on the 24th even though none of us you know my friends myself really thought that you know there would be a, a full scale attack on ukraine i mean looking back on it it's it's the only almost only natural way well not only but it's 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 a logical way you know next step in in the conflict and yeah so that's something for a different time but yeah we got that on friday come back on friday everybody it'll be not fun um yeah no karasu rivers in europe are twisty and turny and kind of scary um but in fairness a lot of rivers are hard to navigate like rivers people I mean, there are the Colorado River is an example. Of that. Yes, rivers are something that I think a lot of people underestimate. And so they get lost or die on those rivers, and it's not terribly surprising, really, because they don't treat... You have to treat nature with due deference at any time that you're out in nature, or nature will just kill you and not care. Of course. Uh, but yeah, I can I can see why it would rise up to the level of having legends about it or having legends of water demons. There's legends of water demons in England and uh, in English culture and uh, Irish culture, for example. Oh, it's like water sprites or fairies or something. Well, there's fairy legends all over Europe. Um, yeah. Fairies, you know, I don't know what how they became what they did in popular culture because fairies are not like, I mean, your traditional you know, mythical fairies, they, they're scary things, you know. Uh, honestly, I think the archetype for that comes from A Midsummer's Night Dream. The Shakespeare really? play? Yeah. You have, like, Puck, who's mischievous, and he'll screw with you a little bit, but spit you back out. Um... Yeah. Uh, like... As far as I know, in, in, in original Celtic legends... Or Ga Gaelic re legends, like they would abduct people, like actually, like, yes, um, yeah. But like, there are these kind of archetypical ideas. Um, have you ever looked at those old, 
19th century photographs of what are purported to be fairies? Some of them. Like, oh, they're really, I mean, they're not, they're almost certainly not real, but they're unsettling to look at nonetheless. I always found the old seance um, photos very, very disturbing too. Especially the ones that, you know, they, that, you know, purported ghosts and things like this. Um, back to the Dibbuk um, box. Um, what, what, what did you uh, read or watch about that? It's kind of curious to me. Uh, so I first saw the Dibbuk box in an episode of the kind of cringy show that first paranormal witness oh yeah yeah i saw that one too that uh, it's kind of cringy i still have all the episodes that i purchased uh, and i watch it from time to time when i want you know a cheap thrill but uh so you saw that episode about the divic and then there was movies that came out yeah a d book in Actually, I think I think that, as far as I know, I'm not an expert in, uh, you know, in, in I, I'm not an expert in, in, you know, the Jewish religion. But as far as um, I don't think it, it, that the D book, the concept of it exists in any other Jewish culture other than Ashkenazic, so European, East European Jewish culture. And um, essentially, what it is is a wayward spirit. Um, it's not necessarily a demon. It's something that has yes. lost its way on the way to um, the next plane. And um, yeah, there's um, among East European Jews, actually, like uh, they were a very superstitious um, group. And there's a lot of, you know, legends, different incantations, spells to ward off against the book or Dibokim in the plural is what they would call them. Um, it's very interesting. I don't know if you ever, that's that's another thing we can talk about. Maybe we should do like uh, various religions, but um, there's like uh, uh, a group um, of faith healers that existed in um, Eastern Europe, I think around the, um, 16th and or 17th and 18th centuries and they were called the balsham which means like the people who speak god's name or his holy name and uh even local christians so like slavic christians would would employ their help um to ward off against various you know unseen forces and also like you know heal them like they had various folk remedies and things like this some of which were very counterintuitive so like there's an old um uh book i think in hebrew it's like a, a book of folk remedies and to treat a upset stomach they make a tea from horse dung no thank you yeah it sounds like you'd be making the problem a lot worse but well, these, these, yeah, these old things exist find this damn cave painting Is this the one I'm looking for? This is the right cave, but not the right image. I, I don't see images on our podcast. I don't have them up yet. I, I was going to put it up when I found it. Um. Anyway, going back to this unified theory of things and clusters and archetypes, archetypes really in particular, is um, the concept of Pan, the Greek god, because Puck brought it to head, uh, the Greek god Puck Pan, Pan the trickster god who, you know, up and died, good for him. Uh, like people find that Isn't particular, 
the modern incline the modern visual representation of the devil yes yeah um that's um i mean this is a whole different topic we could talk about you know in regard to um satan i think particularly the concept of the modern concept of satan versus the biblical one or Demonology is a particularly interesting especially in cultural cultural the topic. The word demonology, demonology is, is, is very interesting. It, it's an, I, um, I, like you look the topic, at the, the book, the, um, Malice Maleficarum. Malice Maleficarum, yeah. The, uh, the, the thing that I find most interesting about Christian conception of demons is that a lot of these demons that Christians name are other cultures' gods. Oh yeah. Um, In Judaism, though, too. It, but it's they, well, they they, they, they basically pick it up and port over Judaism's and monotheistic Judaism's concept of God is downstream from their polytheistic concept of God. So I'm willing to bet significantly that a lot of things that end up being classified as demons were once canite gods most of them yeah uh just um, the like, thing is, is you know judaism itself evolves from canaanite religion um this is what we know from the archaeo archaeological evidence um, right. that exists is essentially judaism originates um from Canaanite religion and the people within the Levant who become, you know, um, Israelites are essentially just one of, you know, many different federations of, of Canaanite tribes. Um, I think it's monolatry that they first practice before, like they first do polytheistic, they transition to monolatry, which means that they acknowledge the existence of other gods but worship only one right um and then it evolves into a complete disregard and abandonment of all the other uh gods well, and of at, course they're then labeled as as idols and various things like that. at some point they come into contact with zoroastrianism um of course, during the Babylonian exile. Yes, and, and like that has a you. If you understand much of Zoroastrianism, you you see huge parallels between modern Christian and Jewish belief and Islamic belief to a certain extent, um, and Zoroastrianism's duality, yeah. like this one God and then there's this evil thing, and like, and that's course, and like Judaism didn't have that before its um, contact with Zoroastrianism. Yes. Which makes it the most influential religion that no one's ever heard of. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing, though, like, for instance, what comes to mind is Carthage principally worships Baal, which is spelled the exact same way as the Jewish demon. And Carthage is originally a Phoenician colony. And if it's a Phoenician colony, they would have been in the same region as the Canaanites. So, of course, yeah. You Phoenicians can, were Canaanites. Right. You can trace, you can trace this lineage just going across. Have you ever uh, examined the passage? I forget which. Um, it's not Proverbs. It's, it's Psalm. I forget which Psalm it is, but it's essentially um, you put Yahweh, you put thy the pillars of the temple on the waters. You make you make it the cloud, or you make the clouds. Uh, you, you make the clouds your chariot. You ride the wings of the wind. It's an allusion to, you know, the Abrahamic God being that old God of war and storm gods, the Lord of hosts, which means, you know, the lords of heavenly armies. Yes. So it's like um, that, that. Those are the origins of um, of uh, the Abrahamic uh, God. Well, even reading the Bible, even Genesis, you have like I, I find that very interesting, actually. You have like three different conceptions of God in the first three books of Genesis. That are very clearly, if you look back at the archaeological evidence, very clearly different gods. Uh, yeah. And and getting back to that, like it becomes this 
it's so almost codified. Like I think you could even actually call it a codified study of demonology in Western European tradition. Um, where they, they like exorcists have names for demons that correspond to gods in other cultures. Of course, it's very, very. I think that Christianity starts to adopt some of the European gods as demons. Yes, um, and as it expands throughout Europe, Puck in that's particular. Where you get the image of, Pan, of, of you know being like I mean the devil is, is taking on you know the image of of uh, Pan. I guess. It takes on the image of Pan, and then the other one that often gets conflated with Pan is the Green Man. The Green Man yes, the Celtic. The, the Celtic Green Man, which. Mm -hmm. Seems like a relatively peaceful guy. Like, I could get behind worshipping the green man. Yeah. Uh, he seems like a lot of fun. Wine and sex. That seems great. Uh, but um, he gets conflated to this witchcraft kind of thing. Uh, which and just... For medieval Christians, that, that doesn't sound like... You know, that's very... Yeah, but they were drinking a lot and they were having a lot of sex. So I'm not entirely certain who they were getting off judging. So... Yeah, but you know, publicly, it, it, the not. the great hypocrisy of Christianity is that it gets rid of fun while privately it, espousing it behind closed doors. Of course, Especially that's like you know various oh, old dynasties like the Borgia. Only one of them. Now the Borgia were pretty open about it too. Uh, I can't so, believe they had orgies in the in the, in the Vatican. That's not terribly surprising to me. The Vatican has so much freaking money, and a whole lot of power was concentrated there for most of medieval history. Uh, I remember seeing it, you know, even just being in awe of St. Peter's Square the, the first time I went there. It's astounding, really, just to see those buildings, you know, and, and know the history and the power just in general like the money that this institution has of course so i i haven't been to utah yet and i haven't seen the uh tabernacle church you you, cathedral. I don't know what they call it. you can see I plenty of you can see plenty of incredibly ornate mormon churches well really anywhere mm -hmm. there's one not that far from me here there's that one out by orland where we were uh, I don't know if you remember that one. I, um, you know, I'm often, I think like, you know, Protestantism, especially, you know, as, as you go into later m movements, I remember I was, I was talking to a Ukrainian friend of mine and she was saying, I just don't understand how like, um, forget how she related to protestant churches but she's like if this is supposed to be god's house why does it look like a um you know she, she was basically like ripping on the non ornateness and austere nature of protestant you know american <clears throat> protestant churches and um you know because I, I was talking to her about the one that i was going to which um you know had russian language it has russian language uh, service and she was just like you know how do you go to a place like that you know it, it well orthodox churches are a little extra uh oh a little <laughs> little extra They're a lot ah uh, i've been in a couple like, hmm. you know and that's actually one thing that's you know it's it's um with orthodox churches is it, it is antithetical a bit because you have images you know of saints and all these other things and in traditional, I don't know if in, in, in Roman Catholicism, it's the same. You do have a lot of imagery, especially in early Catholicism and some of the early churches. The You have the stained glass windows, various things like this. But traditionally, um, I remember, isn't it true that when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, when they went into the temple, they were astounded when they saw nothing, you know, that there wasn't an image of the Israelite God. Yes. Uh, 
In fairness to the Romans, though, they had a hard time conceptualizing things outside of Rome and Roman religion. Of course. Like, they had a really hard time conceptualizing Judaism in general. I don't know if you ever watched the HBO series Rome. No, I haven't. Uh, so it tells a story. The first season is about Julius Caesar and his civil war. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a fairly compressed event. And the second season is about Mark Antony and uh, Augustus. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, it covers, it basically takes the first and second triumvirate and smushes it together in a fairly small time frame. It's a very good show, though. Uh, one of the key features of the series Rome is that I absolutely love is they have a newsreader who kind of does events. Like he, he sort of narrates events by going out into the square and announcing things to the people in the, in the forum. Uh, and he's basically one of the few static characters throughout the entire series. But he goes out. Yeah, what's up, Bubba? He goes out, and um, it's about the time that Herod is visiting Rome when the triumvirate, the second triumvirate's in power, and he's like, "King Herod is in Jerusalem or in Rome today. Keep all mockery of Jews and their one God to an absolute minimum." <laughs> and it's just, it, they did a great job in that show of portraying the kind of almost alien way that these cultures interacted. Uh, yeah. We've gotten way off topic, haven't we? We, we really have. We were supposed to, this is why we need a prompt. <laughs> yes. We fire the producer. It's me. Fire me. Um, but no, I mean, that's how it happens when two guys talk history. Pretty much with that. I think I'm going to, I'm going to call it a night. Yeah. I have to take care of, I'm like, I got to take some Pepto-Bismol. Doctor, um, brother. Doctor. I, I really, really should. I was feeling, I'm feeling better than I was yesterday. Yesterday, my stomach was about as bad as it's ever been. And yeah, I, I don't know. I've heard, I, I went into my, my job today just very briefly to, to do some work. And then I left. But like, I heard from some coworkers that there's a stomach virus going around. So. Oh, good. Uh so yeah, before we go, we have kind of a packed schedule for the rest of the week, assuming we keep it. So tomorrow night, I don't know what's happening. We will reconvene and figure out the schedule sometime tomorrow. But we are going to make try our best for the 24th to be Ukraine update. Um, we'll be able to do that for sure. That's, yes. That's a, a given. Um, I'm going to have some words to say for sure. Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very heavy topic for me, as you guys all know. So it'll be, it'll be, uh, interesting. Um, it'll be, yeah. All right. I want to thank everybody for that. I think, um, yeah, Yeah, same here. I want to thank people for, for joining us. So stay tuned for the rest of the schedule. Yep. Stay tuned. All right. Have a